Hello, everyone, and welcome to the React Native Show podcast. And we are meeting here today to celebrate the newest release of Repack, which is 3.0. Uh, React 3.0 brings you support for module federation. And so I thought that it would be a good idea to talk, to talk more about module federation. And there is no one better <laughs> to talk about module federation than my guest today, which is Zach Jackson who is the maintainer of Webpack and the creator of Module Federation concept. And our second guest is Pavel Trisra, the creator of Repack. So guys, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Yeah, hello, welcome. Hey, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks. So uh, Pavel, uh, you already uh, were on the show before and you talked about Repack. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself. Can you shortly uh, tell us something about what Repack is? Yeah, so I'm, I'm Pavel, uh, also known in, on the internet as uh, Zamotane, especially on GitHub. I'm the uh, creator of Repack and whole core maintainer. Uh, the whole was a predecessor to, to the Repack. And I'm a software developer based in Poland, in Wrocław. And um, Repack is a, a toolkit for, uh, for Webpack, which allows you to use Webpack and all of its ecosystem in uh, React Native applications. So by default, when you, use, um, when you write uh, React Native applications, you would use Metro, but it is an option right now, thanks to Repack, to use Webpack for uh, all the bundling and the features, uh, the infrastructure features that um, Webpack supports. Yeah, so we have an episode about that from like a year and something ago. Go check that one. And we are meeting here today because the version 3.0 just dropped a few weeks ago or months. I don't know. Um, so what's new? What's you? Sorry. What's new in 3.0? So 3.0 is um, an extension of 2.0, uh, but it improves on the API that you could use. Uh, previously in 2.0, uh, Repack was split across multiple plugins, but right now you can use a single Repack plugin and configure it the way you want it. So that's a um, entry, we're trying to lower the entry buyer, barrier to Repack uh, doing that, but we are also preparing the, uh, the stage for module federation um, support in Repack, the proper one, in 2.0, you technically could use module federation, but it was very painful and very manual work. Uh, in 3.0, we are uh, designing the APIs and changing the internals to make this um, to make module federation support way better. And so, the new APIs for module federation, the uh, long-awaited documentation in in Repack for how to use module federation uh, in React Native, that's the uh, the basics of uh, 3.0 release. Yeah, so I actually used module federation in Repack already. I know that it's there. I know that it works. So that's that's good. Thank you, Pavel. And our first guest, who I will introduce as a second guest, is Zach Jackson. So, um, Zach, can you tell us some more about yourself, how you got involved in Webpack, how you created module federation, stuff like that? Yeah, um, let's see. So I'm a uh, principal engineer over at Lululemon, and um, I have a long history with uh, front ends and front end architecture. Um, how I got involved in Webpack is actually through um, my work with code splitting. So I don't know if any of you have worked with React. If you remember uh, <laughs> server side rendering uh, React code that you would code split, like back in the React 15 days, it was pretty much not possible to do that. Um, and so we set out and built the world's first uh, code split server side rendering capability. It was known as React Universal Component and that whole ecosystem. And that inspired React Loadable, Loadable Component, and 
Next.js and everybody else, they all use the same design that we had created back in 2016. The same underlying mechanics for um, code splitting SSR. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of like how I got I introduced into Webpack and then how I became part of the Webpack Foundation and the maintainers was um, through one of the packages I owned for that ecosystem was uh, extract CSS chunks and uh, it had the capability to hot reload actual CSS and many CSS at the time could not hot reload. So it started with me just opening a pull request on their on their docs and on their on their um, and on the on the readme saying like use my plugin it does everything many CSS does but it supports hot reloading so you don't need to use style loader to do it and then the maintainers were like what how about you merge your project with mini CSS and it becomes mini CSS and I was like well I don't really give away my work unless I'm part of like the project otherwise I'd prefer yeah. to keep it under my own and so then they and then you know two days later I get an invite from Tobias the founder of Webpack inviting me to the slack channel and you know bring me in as like a, a you know a core contributor to the project and you know since then, it's just continued to go on and on. Um, and okay. yeah, like, so, you know, started out what? with code splitting, and we started with, you know, cool, like, we need to be able to code split on the server and on the browser. And I was working at a, a company where we had over 150 micro front ends, and there could be 30 on any page at any given time. And that's when I started to think about you know, the current ways to manage externals or shared modules between all of these things isn't really tenable. And, you know, the idea I'd had at the time was like, well, I want to be able to code split chunks from other builds. And, you know, that was 2017. And then by 2019, I opened the merge proposal for what's now known as Module Federation. Well, 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 wait, wait, wait. That is my second question to you. So <laughs> thanks for introducing yourself. Thanks for letting us know how you got involved in Webpack. And actually, my second question is, how does one comes up with this crazy idea of module federation? So that's one. Uh, what are the problems that you are trying to solve with module federation? What are the use cases, basically? And with that, tell us what it is, actually, what module federation is. Yeah, sure. So um, I think like what I did initially. So yeah, the reason I came up with it or how I came up with it, it was it was mostly just um, dealing with problems of scale and experiencing issues that I really didn't like about the ecosystem. And the main one was the NPM based delivery system with. Um, you know, like like I said, like the first company I worked at, we have 150 micro front ends, and how we would render them and do everything for that was, you would create, say, your navigation or create, you know, your your carousel card or your product card component. You would then have to uh, publish it to npm. We then had to wait for Greenbot or Greenkeeper to kick in, see that there was an update, and then PR the update to like the main layout engine that we would have so the whole process took like 30 to 40 minutes at least just to get the code to show up and the problem got much worse if it's like two packages down so if carousel depends on you know image component and i have to install image component into carousel release a new copy of image first turn around release another copy of carousel turn around release another copy of the layout engine you know easily that turns into half your day can just be spent trying to publish packages and get them consumed well, in a, a micro setup. Too. I think it's a week for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you see you see the problem there. Like, it, it expands dramatically. And that's just if you try... I mean, even right now, like my MegaNav, okay, the MegaNav consumes the component library. It consumes the other thing. And if it's the NPM-based flow, it can take days just to sync it all up. And then the mega nav still has to be installed into the 55 code bases that I currently look after. And so that could take up to two weeks per code base to go through all the loops. So the amount of time and money you lose with the current ecosystem 
is pretty high considering the way I always look at it is like, you know, I kind of miss the jQuery days. You'd add the jQuery widget from like the Google CDN or whatever, and you press save and it's done. And then we got into bundling and suddenly everything became so much more complicated compared to like the good old jQuery days. So I kind of wanted to bring back some of that simplicity where, um, you know, working with code splitting a lot and kind of perfecting that with server-side rendering and, and React and all of that is, well, why can't I import chunks from another Webpack build? It's all Webpack, so why can't I just load a chunk from somebody else? And um, that's kind of where the idea came from. It's just dealing with things at scale. It gets ex exponentially slower. And I knew code splitting really well because I wrote a lot of the code splitting like stuff. So, you know, it was kind of just the natural conclusion to go to of like, well, if I get code splitting working really well, well, why can't I import a chunk from somebody else's build? And then yeah. eventually we kind of came out with the, the concept for, um, you know, federation. So is it fair to say that the module federation is an answer to uh, complexity of publishing shared common code in the NPM packages, and you just wanted to bring back some of the jQuery simplicity to the equation? Yeah, for the most part, it's just, it's an answer to, you know, yeah, it's an answer to organizational agility problems. The bigger an organization gets, the slower engineering tends to move. Yeah. If you want engineering to stay fast, you can always do things such as micro front end or whatever, where you get the independent autonomous deployments but that comes at the cost of the user. So now, um, you know, I could, I could do, um, I could do the, I could do this without federation, but I would have to load several extra megabytes of code in, in the browser. So whatever makes engineer life better usually comes at the cost of the user's experience. So how do I not sacrifice the user experience, but still provide a autonomous deployment structure similar to the back end of microservice. I can just deploy my microservice, but the system as a whole still works. How do we bring those kind of good patterns into front end with the limitations and constraints that we have of a user facing system and a UI typically, or a bandwidth constrained system? Okay, Zach, I have a random question for you. Sorry to <laughs> interrupt. No, 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 uh, please take it away. Was the Webpack your first choice, or were you thinking about adding Module Federation to other bundlers when you were creating Module Federation? W was it like the, the company was using Webpack, and so you would get the, uh, the benefits of your company uh, immediately, or did, was there any more reasoning behind Webpack? Uh, in part, uh, that... The other thing is, is I've been a contributor to Webpack since version one. So I've, and like when I started my career, I did everything and, you know, like, you know, I started with Gulp and Grunt and that, and then Webpack came out and I'm like, here's a tool that knows everything about my code base all going into one. And so I started investing heavily in that. So when it came down to this, my natural choice was just to go to Webpack because I've known it since V1. I know the API intimately, all of that. The other thing, though, is if I do, I do, keep, I do track other bundlers. I just don't really use them much. But no other bundler has a strong enough API to pull this off either. And when we started working with Federation, we quickly realized that this will be extremely difficult to try and do on another bundler. The main thing that's missing from other bundlers, besides just a good API in general, is they don't have the concept of a module factory, which is something that Webpack was very clever about um, introducing. And the general idea of a module factory is when I go to import something, it's not going to give me exactly what I asked for, which is usually how all the other bundlers work. If you require the file, here's the file that comes back. Unless they put another plugin on, which is like a, a big loader where all they do is say, we'll take the text, put it over here, and, you know, for CSS, they just import another third party that injects CSS, and they put the string that it must inject below it, or something like that. In module factories, the nice thing is, is I can say, well, when I import something, what the module is that I actually import can be anything that I choose. And so that's how we could make it work with Webpack, because we could say you can import something that doesn't exist, but it's going to module export something back. And that's this special remote connection module. Yeah. And so, I, yeah. I, yeah, I, I think the other 
an extension of what you said is that a lot of bundlers, other bundlers that are in Webpack, don't have module system in runtime. And for example, Rollup will just take all the dependency tree and combine it together as a single executable JavaScript with no modules. So like splitting that or requiring different modules from somewhere else is just not going to fly w without module system. Yeah, like a lot of uh, no, nobody, unless you go, like, actually use Webpack as like a meta framework, very few realize that Webpack is different from all the others because Webpack is, the way I see Webpack is it's, it's just as much as a feature as what my feature developers write. Like the difference between writing a feature for the business and writing a Webpack plugin, it's kind of the same. Like we use Webpack as a utility and we, because it's a, it's half of Webpack is build time, half of Webpack is runtime. So I can create these kind of build time, runtime combos where during build, I'll prepare the system so that the Webpack runtime part can interpret information that I had put down at build and they can kind of work together at different stages of the application's lifecycle. A lot of other bundlers will lean heavily on browser standards to do this work, which means the way I like to think of it almost is a lot of the other bundlers don't, they don't really have like middleware for execution. Whereas Webpack's almost middleware between what the browser is going to do and what you're going to tell the browser to do. So I can lean on browser standards more, but I still want something like the Kubernetes of JavaScript. I need a command and control center that can leverage native standards when it's a good idea to do it, but I still need something to control those native standards, not just say, if the browser can't do it, the bundler's tough luck. I need, I need a system that does both. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, yeah, I, I want to move on to Pavel, actually. He was so eager to ask questions, so I'm going to ask him a question. Pavel, um, what was the idea behind bringing first Webpack to React Native ecosystem and then to incorporate module federation as well, uh, to implement module federation as well? Okay, so... The, uh, the idea of bringing Webpack into React Native ecosystem dates back to like a few years ago where Hall was created. Hall was the predecessor for, for the Repack. And the main idea there uh, to put Webpack into React Native ecosystem was to get all the features of Webpack uh, utilized in situations where you would use Metro uh, but because uh, Metro had so many limitations, it was just not possible, not feasible, or very difficult to implement. So <clears throat> because of the limitations of Metro, which also makes Metro a great choice for new, user, new users or just not advanced users, uh, was a limitation for pro users, uh, super users, however you want to call them, who needed those features and this extra capabilities that Webpack provided. So that was the reason Hall was created. And so Repack was, an, uh, was a new, um, new version of the Hall with, uh, without carrying the, the, the legacy tech debt and the solutions that we had in Hall that were not good enough for some production use cases. And so we created Repack um, and change the, um, the how how you think about Repack. So right now we we say that Repack is a toolkit for for Webpack. Previously, Hall was a bundler which was using Webpack under the hood, but it was considered a bundler. So it had uh, it had their its own configuration file and its own schema and so on. We didn't want to carry over that legacy. We wanted to to be a repack to be more lean and uh, just reduce the maintenance surface that we would have to maintain in the repack, which is still very huge surface uh, to bring all the functionalities of Webpack and Module Federation. So we wanted to limit that surface as much as possible. And, and so the repack was born. And why we were removing parts that we didn't want to maintain or with just not a good API and experience for the user, we, uh, it was a time that a lot of people were 
starting to ask questions about code splitting in a mobile ecosystem. And uh, it was actually uh, the reason why Mojo Federation was added to Repack it was that it just sort of happens that Mojo Federation was a thing. So we thought, huh, that makes a good idea. Maybe we should add that to Repack. And that, that's how we added it to, to Repack. We had yeah, some... Sorry, I was mm -hmm. going to ask. So it's the same Webpack that I can use, use on the web that I use in my Repack application, is it? Yes and no. <laughs> I was so, going to say yes and no. <laughs> best, best answer. <laughs> yeah. So Webpack is the same, but what you get uh, when Webpack builds and the code that is run is not quite the same. Okay. So what are the differences? So first of all, um, the bundle that you get, if you compare the bundle from for the web and for React Native, uh, all the um, web DOM APIs are removed. They, they are just not there in, in the bundle. Uh, there are some few uh, cases when we had to like um, replace some modules from React Native because they were designed for Metro, which we... Uh, this is not a metro, this is Webpack. So yeah, yeah. we have to provide different implementations for different features like um, logs in the terminal that, that you run in, in your application, like uh, React Refresh. Th this part is, is done uh, in a different way compared to metro. So we had to do some, some tweaks to, to the bundle. We also don't use uh, default targets that Webpack provides. Uh, if you are advanced user, you probably know what I'm talking about. But technically, if you create a bundle with Webpack, it defaults to web target. You can customize different targets, but we just don't use any target at all. We customize every every part of Webpack to fit our React Native needs. Um, yeah. So, yeah. A, you uh, a good, uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of similarities between uh, when I looked at your, when I looked at the repack code to see how you guys done it, I was like, oh, this looks uh, very familiar because how uh, Node Federation works. So Module Federation for Node Server, it's almost the same concept where we say, um, like you said, Webpack has targets. If you say target web, when you import a chunk, that means inject a script into the DOM. If you're in Node, that means create a common JS like require statement or um, if it, you're using the async node target, would be fs read file and vm run in this context. And so um, if you say target false, then you can say, well, here's the file system. Hey, Webpack, here's your file system. When I tell you to get a chunk, here's what ch getting a chunk means. And um, for the node federation, it was saying, all Webpack cares about is that I give it a string, so I just use HTTP. And I say, hey, HTTP... HTTP, get a readable stream, get the string back, and once you get the string, pass it to the to Webpack's like chunk registration layer. And um, so yeah, so that's the nice thing about Webpack. It's super flexible where it's still Webpack, but all we're doing is retraining. When you ask for a chunk, all you care about is that it gives you back a string with the chunk code in it, but how we give you that string can be different based on the transport layer of the system you're running it on. Okay, okay. So we talked about Webpack in web and mobile similarities. Let's then ask the question about module federation. What are the use cases for module federation in mobile application world? Anyone? Um, I, I'll, I'll go first, but I don't have a ton of context because I don't work with React Native applications a whole lot, but... Um, the main thing that I've seen from the, the from the companies that I support who do is in mobile, I think this is also one of the big things about React Native that was so great. You had the concept of bundle dropping. So I can circumvent the app store unless I need to do an update to like that bridge, the native bridge itself. I don't need to re-release on the app store. Well, that's all great, but you now are stuck with the same monolithic problem of scale. And if you have a really big app or you have certain compliance things, how does each team A-B test or roll out certain features and do these type of things where they just want to replace a piece of the code base or a screen? They don't want to have to rebuild and re-release and do a new bundle drop of the whole native application again. So Federation is quite useful there because you get similar to what you'd want in micro front ends. You could have a big team where 
parts of the application are controlled and independently releasable from other parts of the application. It's not a monolithic giant build where the whole thing must be re-released. It just adds a lot of organizational agility. But that, that's the main thing that I've seen the benefit is, is uh, you can ship things over the air really quickly, really scoped to a specific team rather than scoped to the entire product as a whole that has to go through a full release. Yeah, I think what's important here is the independent teams, right? Because the teams can uh, release their module and it's going to be consumed by the main application independently uh, as opposed to the previous solutions for um, delivery over the air of the bundle of the JS bundle. I think it was the code. It's, it's the code push when you have to release the whole bundle again for the application to, to read it all. Yeah, uh, so... Um Extending uh, Zach's uh, thought about um, shipping something over the air with, uh, with circumventing App Store. This is actually the use case that works great on web, but don't work great on mobile. Because on mobile, the App Stores can enforce some limitations in their terms of service. And we actually don't recommend uh, adding features uh, on the fly, let's just say, or replacing the features uh, without doing a new release. Because then you get in some shady waters and you can get your app removed, yeah. which we don't recommend. Permanently. And we had that <laughs> we have this section in documentation, so we can go on repack site and, and read it. So what we recommend using module federation on, on mobile for? Well, uh, what we called it is optimi optimization, actually. So when when you're when you have a, an application with like hundreds of features, not every user might use all of the features. So what we want Module Federation to use for is to load the basic set of features and get the, the other features on demand when the user wants it. Technically, you could say that this is adding features on, on demand, but it's actually not because those features are just not loaded, but they are available in the application. You're not uh, not changing the feature set. Uh, so when you when you supply this application into review, you can give the reviewers the access to all the features, and they can they can load it. Uh, it will just looks like going to feature A takes a little bit more time because there is a network request and the JavaScript execution happens. But technically, that's a feature that exists in the application. So uh, this allows to uh, work around the problem that um, app stores want to prevent when the user, uh, the reviewer, opens an app, see the features, and they all look great. But when the user opens an app, the um, creator of an app uh, does a over-the-air update, which totally replaces these features which can be a good thing, but can also be used in a malicious way. Yeah, okay. So we recommend to use Module Federation as a sort of optimization, uh, which also plays nicely into scaling uh, your development team. Because if you have a lot of teams, a lot of products, you can combine them all into one big application, also known as super app, <laughs> or mini apps approach, uh, talking, about, talking about buzzwords here. And uh, you can um, split those features and only supply them to specific groups of customers based on, I don't know, subscription plans or, or something like that, or based on just a need that we don't ship, up, uh, we don't ship the code or feature that the user doesn't want to use. Yeah, but uh, I can also imagine a use case when you go past the App Store. You don't go to the App Store. You have like a huge corporation. You uh, sideload the application on some like uh, proprietary device. And then you have just one app and you do over the air updates yeah. of the features for your employees or, yeah. or stuff like I, that. If it's the environment you're targeting, yes, you could, you could do that. There is nothing preventing you. But if you're using like regular App Store, Google Play, then you have to play by the rules. Okay, so I want to talk about some technical details, but not too technical because I'm an ignorant and I don't know anything about Webpack. So uh, treat me well, guys here. But the one, one thing that I know is that when I use Module Federation on the web, my website somehow gets the remote chunk and plugs it in in my application. So that is that how it works in a website scenario. Where do my 
mobile application reaches out for this remote chunk? Where does this remote chunk live? Great question. And it reaches out to place when you tell it to reach. So uh, in order to support <laughs> module federation in Repack, we had to add some new APIs, um, which is called in Repack 3.0, a uh, resolver. And you uh, provide an implementation for the resolver uh, to tell the Webpack runtime code how to reach chunks, containers, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, you could do, do it in a build time by uh, using remotes in a module federation plugin configuration, which is a new feature added in Repack 3.0 compared to the Repack 2.0. Yeah, with, with the help of Zach, because he he got um, he provided an input and and make this make uh, that helped me make this feature uh, possible. And uh, so you can choose uh, if you want to provide this location in build time, but you can also do it in in the runtime with with resolvers. And you can have multiple resolvers, and it's all. Uh, documented how they work and what's the order of them and what are the options and so on. But at the end of the day, when the resolver figures out where your container or chunk is located, it will tell the native site, native module, uh, where it's located, go fetch it and run it. And then once the uh, React Native... Um, engine that handles JavaScript uh, gets into evaluating the JavaScript, then it goes back into Webpack runtime and play, and in, it integrates everything together. Okay. So I, the mechanics on how, and the reason that this is possible to do, because you can, you, you can uh, use just like require or import from, you don't have to always async import by design of Webpack. So you can have asynchronous code that behaves synchronously. But the real trick on how this is possible to do, where you can connect to this remote and we could say, delegate the loading to say, um, the native bridge script loader, or to like, for me, I do it with Node.js, similar concept, but the whole mechanism is asynchronous. So when you request a remote, uh, what Webpack expects is that it's gonna be a promise, module exports, new promise, and the resolve of that promise is going to be the remote entries interface. And then whenever Webpack wants to get a actual module, federated module out of it, it uses a, the get call. And the get call is asynchronous as well. And then that executes a factory. So Webpack knows if this is federation, I expect this to be a promise that will resolve the thing that I want. And whenever I'm retrieving anything out of it, I expect that to be a promise as well. And so it knows the exports is always the resolve of the promise. The exports isn't the result isn't the exported promise implementation itself. So now we could say, okay, hey, Webpack's asking for this. I could say, ping an API and say, hey, I'm this host looking for this remote in this environment. An API could respond and say, okay, here's the JSON. You should use this script from this S3 bucket at this version. And then I could inject the script and say, cool, resolve. Hey, Webpack, here's the script I've injected. Here's the API for you. So it gives you a lot of flexibility because Webpack could just sit and wait indefinitely. So as long as you're able to return the interface, you can, do, you can get that interface however you want. And so that's the thing I think is really great about the Federation API is it offers you like almost an asynchronous gate into Webpack where you can tell Webpack, wait for me to perform logic, whatever logic I perform, wait for it, and the end result of that will be the module you're asking for. And that's something that I haven't seen very possible to do in any other bundler is to programmatically control what import means case by case basis. Like imagine A-B test or authentication. Are you a pro user? If you're a pro user, you could tell Webpack, check if they're a pro user, and if they're a pro user, the federated remote is the pro remote, not the free remote. And you would either have to code that logic into your code base statically and deal with all the various scenarios, which gets complicated, because then you'd have to, if it was NPM package, you'd have to say, you know, do I import pro package or a free package? So now you have to import everything twice. With federation, it's very nice, because you could just say, well, I'm just going to say import, you know, um, let's say uh, my remote, 
but my remote, you could tell Webpack, hey, my remote resolves to either the pro pointer or the free pointer, but all your imports and all your code doesn't need to change to support my remote being 10, 15, 20, 100 different possible responses. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and we utilize that flexibility and that asynchronous nature that, that module federations enable us to do in resolvers. Uh, so whenever you, um, you're re uh, requesting a remote container or chunk, you can run asynchronous logic to figure out the URL. So you could have remote config, you can have A-B testing, you can ha have whatever you want as long as it's asynchronous uh, and uses the promises, you can add that to a resolver to, uh, to customize where your uh, code is located and what you, what you want Webpack to, uh, to load. Okay, so since I think you brought it up, Pavel, I will ask Zach to tell us some more about, uh, Zach, your involvement in Repack specifically. What was your role uh, in development of Repack and uh, Module Federation in Repack specifically? Um, I think my involvement was really, I knew Repack was out there. I had a customer come forward who wanted to improve Module Federation with React Native. And, uh, you know, I went and looked at the code very briefly, and this was still when it was V2, and I'm like, okay, I see how it works. It was still using the low-level API at the time, which uh, the way I look at it is uh, React Native and Next.js very similar in the problem scenario when it comes to Federation. And so since I've already built out the full support for, uh, for Next, when the customer came to me for V2, I looked at it, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is basically, we just need to do what I've done for Next.js and for Node. It's the same code, I, I just need to write it a little differently. So I started doing workshops with them where um, I just wrote almost what V3 ended up having, just working within the limits of V2, but I wrote more or less something using the promise implementation. So I would say the remote entry isn't just the, the URL that you want, but it's new promise, hook into, the, into the, the, the loader, tell the loader to go and get this. Once it gets it back, resolve this back to Webpack. I, I think the only challenge in React Native, from what I understand, is I believe it runs on bare metal. So I don't believe that React Native apps have like a, a full event loop. So something like a promise, I think it gets converted into like a callback chain. So I can't yeah. just do a normal await like I do in Webpack. So when I try to do new promise, go get the remote, it wouldn't actually come back. It, I would log it and it would be there, but Webpack wouldn't see it when I send it back. So I had to like do some like callback tricks to make it work. But basically I was starting to build this out and then I saw about V3 and we started talking and I would kind of try to say, all right, well, here's how I did it in Next. Here's how I did it in Node. Here's what we've gotten to work so far. This is kind of this is the strategies that I'm using to deal with with delegating the the full the nice API I call it where you don't have to learn anything other than you know register your module and import your code like you normally would and so that's kind of where I, my involvement was mostly on the input side where you know this is how I did it here's the code I think here's the code on how I did it more or less um, but I don't know the native part, so then that's kind of where, you know, the collaboration worked out really well. And we ended up with a, a pretty um, a pretty robust end result. The only thing I'm not sure if we ever did end up implementing was the ability to use, like, the at syntax in the plugin itself, or if we still have to register the module in that chunk register up front, and then Federation works. Uh, I think we, we have that support. Uh, but it works by just translating the add syntax into a yeah exactly being added and calling the script manager, which is our native uh, native module, to download and execute the JavaScript. So we we have that support, but it's working slightly different compared to maybe other um, like environments. So and so the nice thing is is that that's exactly how I do it with Next.js and for Node Federation plugin is you feed me the standard API that you can just read the Webpack docs for. 
I parse the options you send me. If I see you're using the at syntax, I go extract URL in global. I pass it to a custom promise, which then goes to my, my node federation chunk loading mechanism, or it repack, it would go to like the native script loading bridge. But it's almost smoke and mirrors where we say you could use it the same way, but we reinterpret the code and we feed to Webpack custom promise modules that do the requested thing, but you don't need to know anything about how that, you don't need to know how the sausage is made. How you yeah. use it in web is more or less how you could configure it in node or configure it in native. And all we're doing is creating factories that, that yield the result you're after. Yeah, I don't know if I understand what you just said, but it sounded like find me all ads and find all and replace something like that. It's it's kind of like when you give me a remote, it'll be like my remote colon, you know, the global name. So what's its name space and then the at symbol HTTP, the location of the remote entry. And so in my node federation plugin, I loop over those objects and I say, take that and then I'm going to replace that string with a string that's called promise space new promise fetch the remote entries text put it into a vm evaluate the vm and then once you get that give me back the remote entries interface and resolve that to webpack so it's really just creating it's almost like if you were to create a webpack loader where i say well this is what you gave me and i'm going to convert that into the thing that works but you still give me just the basic syntax and I'll make something that does the thing you ask it to do. So, okay. yeah. Okay. So, uh, I think we spent a lot of time talking about how great the Webpack is and how great the module federation is. So, I want to ask you a trick question now, guys. And um, the trick question is, what are the common pitfalls of module federation where we shouldn't really do module federation. We should we, we should do something else, but people still want to do the latest and greatest. And yeah, what are those examples? Um, I would say the biggest pitfalls that I see, or the number one pitfall is more uh, a, like a question that I get thrown out. Maybe like I'm a little too direct in my reply for it, but the, 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 first, fit, the first pitfall is if you don't know why you need it, you probably don't need it. So, you know, everybody's like, well, I don't get it. I don't get why we need module federation. My usual reply is then you don't because if you're at that scale, you will know you'll have been searching for any solution and you know, there's really only like maybe two out there. The, 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 so pitfall number one, don't implement it because it's cool. Implement it because there's an actual business rationale for it. Implement federation because you cannot scale anymore or your ability to scale or respond to the market is now directly impacted by the delivery vehicle of your code. So there you go. So if you're a startup, you don't need it unless your startup has a very bespoke use case like white labeling. So that would be the thing number one. Only use it when it's supposed to be used, when there's a real advantage. The second biggest pitfall I would see is everybody shares everything or they often just say, cool, let me share the whole package JSON. That in theory is great, but whenever you share something, we cannot tree shake it because we it gets marked as used in unknown ways. So the number one challenge, problem we see is somebody's like, oh, I shared material UI and now my chunk is 15 megabytes in web. And it's like, <laughs> Yeah, because we can't tree shake the icon, so it's loading fifteen, you know, fifteen thousand icons from Material UI. So sharing, I always th say the remotes and exposing feature modules. That's the main piece. Sharing is a double-edged sword. It's extremely useful, but always look, always double check: is sharing it worth it or not? Like, well, do I share my my, my icons from my component library? No, because I don't need you to download five megabytes of possible icons. I'd rather you just re-download an extra 50 kilobytes of duplicate icon code whenever it's used. So kind of you have to use that common sense on is this thing, is it more beneficial to share or is it more beneficial just to let it download this duplicate code a couple times? Um, mm -hmm. The only place where you have to share it is when you need it to be a singleton. So specifically anything to do with React's context tree or React. 
That kind of leads me into the second pit fallacy in Federation, which is it's not immediately obvious what needs to be shared and how it needs to be shared. Oh, I use React Router and I shared it, but I'm still having problems. Is it shared as a singleton? No. Okay, well, that's the problem. You can only have one object of React Router for everybody to subscribe to. So kind of knowing what should be shared and how requires some just trial and error. Um, and then I would say I would say those are the two big pitfalls that I've, I've seen come up with with using Federation is you need to know how to share certain things and you need to make sure to evaluate that I'm getting a better bundle size by sharing it or an acceptable bundle size by sharing it. And it's always the cost benefit ratio of it. Um, when using yeah. Federation, ensure that the benefits are worth any slight overhead that it adds. And it won't add overhead by default unless you don't share enough or share something that's not really good at sharing, like material UI or you share the index file and that's the entire library and it's massive. In those cases, I usually say share, but put a trailing slash on the end. So like material UI slash, and then that tells Webpack, don't share the index file, share anything that I import that starts with material UI slash. So it gets all the child modules that you, that you used and they're all one by one file, not one giant 20 megabyte index file. That's totally untree shaken. Now it's just, like with Lodash is a good example. If I share Lodash, I get the whole Lodash index.js. If I share Lodash trailing slash, I'll get in my share scope, I'll see it Lodash throttle, Lodash get. And every use of Lodash, I'll see it shared as its own little import name. And so now I'm not downloading all of Lodash, I'm just downloading the, the specific files from Lodash that I used, and nobody else will download Lodash throttle again if somebody had already gotten it, but I didn't have to download all of Lodash. That only works if the package is designed similar to Lodash, where you could like go and import the module directly and not have to go through an index. So when it comes to sharing, usually I say try a few different options and see what the result is and go with the best one. But yeah, that, on that would be the biggest pitfall that I've seen. <laughs> yeah. On top of that, in the mobile space, in React Native space, I would add that if you're just new or starting or not not advanced user of React Native, don't don't use that because you will be overloaded by stuff that is different compared to web. Just in React Native and use whatever is working right now, and in the future maybe invest in module federation. But don't just jump the gun into a big water because you will Reduce get reduce the variables. Yeah, you know, it, we'll get yeah. into into what Zach just said that your bundle is taking hundreds of tens of uh, megabytes for no reason because you you're overloaded or just don't have the uh, the context why this is happening. So use module federation and repack actually all together only if you have a need for it. So only if you need webpack specific features or you need code splitting in React Native and only if you know what you're doing. So, yeah, and even if you know what you're doing, I think the measurement is quite important. The One of the, uh, the, the takeaways from the workshop that I've been a few weeks ago about uh, module federation in Repack was every time you do something, run this um, this tool that that is visualizing your bundle make sure that you know what's inside your bundle so that you don't do something stupid like including tens of thousands of icons or something like that right yeah so uh always when when dealing with repack i can only speak about repack and module federation of repack when you do something check if it's the uh the output or the result that you want basically. okay yeah yeah, that's a big one is, you know, always check the output when configuring it or adding something just to double check it. Um, for the visualization parts and stuff like that, I've actually written a SAS. I haven't tested it with Repack, but we'll definitely touch base and see if um, if we can create an integration between the tool that I've built out. But I've created something called Medusa. You can go and use it. It's called um, HTTPS Medusa .codes. And what Medusa does is it's kind of like bundle analyzer but it's also a command and control system for Federation. So I can log into Medusa 
and I can change what version of a remote I use in production without needing to redeploy production. So I could just go in there and say, production used the previous deploy of this remote, press save, refresh the page, and now production's using the previous one. But Medusa will also support showing you the drift in your bundle size. So if you just shared something new, it'll show you the diff and say, hey, this is what you changed in this release and your bundle size went up by this much. It looks like this shared module is the problem. So trying to tighten that feedback loop up so developers can easily see why did it get bigger or what happened or you know, providing hints that say, hey, you use this everywhere, you should probably share it because all of these apps are doing it. Trying to provide like a way to take all those distributed app graphs and analyze them as one app and provide recommendations and understanding on how things are used. I would say um, one other thing, it's not really a pitfall, it's more just like a, a software design thing, is you if you're gonna build a federated app or if you plan to use federation in the future, you wanna design your code anticipating it to be federated. So what that really means is you don't wanna make weird dependencies or implicit dependencies, like everything's passed from context that's wrapped at the top. And if I run this module just in another app somewhere else, it completely breaks because it's so dependent on implicit imports provided by the parent. So you usually wanna build out federated applications so that they're very self-sustaining. If they need information from the parent app, it should be a very simple API with a simple contract like for your, for your header, you could pass all the header data through props, but if the header data changes in the nav, like how the nav consumes header data and one consumer didn't update the implementation on how they feed it, you can break the application. So usually what I say is say for header, don't feed it the header data, tell the, just feed it hints. Should I use the big mega nav or the simple nav? So simple, true or false, uh, display banner, true or false, but rather have header fetch its own data and just provide the hints about, well, what, what data should I fetch? So that way header runs more or less on its own, fetches its own data, works as isolated as possible, and then your blast radius isn't too large. The way things can break is inherently very few because the API surface is small. So a lot of it comes down to the, like engineering maturity as well. How mature is your engineering department to be able to understand how to build resilient software that can be depended on at runtime. Because it is different than building a monolith where you can just get everything through context and it's always there because it's always one app. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, moving on to the next part, and uh, also, Pavel, you touched on this briefly, the buzzwords, the newest buzzwords in like software development, front-end development, mobile development. So I want to throw some of the buzzwords out there and I need you to play a little game with me. You will tell me how those are connecting to the module federation, to Webpack, to, 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 to other things. So let's start the game with, with you, Pavel. Super apps. Okay, super apps, also known as uh, mini apps. Uh, the, this is the... Um, architecture of a uh, mobile application. I guess you could use that also in other um, non-mobile applications. Uh, but I, I hear that often in mobile applications where you have one big app with multiple features instead of having uh, those features split it into multiple um, discrete dedicated apps. Mm -hmm. So you get one and you use uh, a uh, feature set that is, that is usually loaded on demand. You don't usually ship all the features at all um, to, to the users. And they, they just, uh, through your application, decide, uh, I want this, this feature or th that feature. And so this is a, uh, I, I call it architectural style of application, which uh, is very um, direct with... Um, uh, interaction with the user. So you uh, you can have a super app or mini apps implemented in a way that doesn't use module federation or uses uh, not not even uses code splitting. You can you can figure out way to to do it. And so you can have super apps without using module federation. But also you can have super apps with module federation 
if there is actual business case for for that or mm-hmm. you're just at scale and doing it any other different way is just not feasible for you. So super apps and mini apps, I would put that into a architectural style that uh, touches on the user experience, but can also utilize, but the solution for the super apps and mini apps can be different. And one of the solutions for that is module federation or code splitting. Okay. Zach, I have a buzzword for you for my little game. And I think you already answered that, but uh, I will play my ignorant card here. And I'm going to say, how does micro front ends connect to module federation? So it's okay. Yeah. So micro front ends, you can build micro. We've been doing micro front ends for a long time. Federation didn't suddenly make micro front ends a thing, but the general feeling of micro front end pre module federation was it's very complicated and it's normally not really worth it. Like I've never seen a good micro front end implementation, which is why I built federation because they were all equally bad. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> federation goes very nicely with micro front ends. It, it supports that whole thing where cool these, you, and you can do them in different styles. The way that I build micro front ends is using a single app tree which I refer to as polylithic architecture. So it's it, it at, at build time, it's micro. At runtime, it's a monolith. So it executes as a single system, even though it's a bunch of polylithic built pieces. That's my preference. And that's why Federation was designed, because I can just require the code, and I really like that, and I can pass context around safely or stuff like that. There are still other ways to enable a micro front end, like the standard one where you have a bunch of divs and you mount different apps to different divs. And you could just use Federation to kickstart the mount process and share the dependencies, but still mount totally separate apps onto different places in the document. And so Federation comes in really great because it works with like the single spa style as well, which is mounting DOM nodes onto different places. Um, or with my preference, which is kind of the, 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 the modular monolith type design. Um, I would say micro front ends is like the big buzzword. And that's kind of was my initial rationale in the original merge proposal for Federation to Webpack was it enables micro front end. What ended up happening though, and we didn't realize it at the time is we built it and it ended up being a lot more powerful than we had initially designed it to be. And so while micro, while the front end is probably the biggest known use case for Federation, we've seen it show up in React Native, which is very similar to not the front end the way it was intended. But using module Federation for back end only implementations like on Express servers or Nest.js or for Apollo or anything like that, you could use Federation as a back end architecture for hexagonal architecture as well. And it does all the benefits you get from front end, you get the same ease and power and flexibility for building out back end services as well. And we've built out a couple really powerful uh, back end systems using this. Where you know, I think the biggest test of the technology was uh, we have a, a a whole city built on module federation for front end and for the back end. And it's polyglot, so we can use Federation to transport non-JavaScript code like uh, Java or .NET. So I can use a federated .NET module and run, say, my order service in .NET via Federation on any server available to handle it. And um, sorry, the integration this steps. Scary. This sounds freaking scary to me. <laughs> it, it well, com- it's. <laughs> it's 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 really cool if you if you need polyglot and you want to build it out it's extremely effective to have that delivery mechanism where i can yeah. send feder- i'm not stuck with the file system but i can send compiled code via webpack and use something say like a webassembly to say uh this is a dot net webassembly module federation deliver it to me and now execute this in a safe manner um but i would say the other the other very interesting thing it, like we would see it in front end, but where it really shows up is in back end, where we've got services out there where 
To integrate another backend service with a different service is literally one line of code and you commit and push and the entire service is integrated. You don't have to stand up more servers. You don't have to set up infrastructure. You drop in one line of code, hit deploy, and everything is stood up on the fly, which is a huge benefit compared to like the Death Star architecture that starts to form around around microservices. So I see Federation as just, you know, it's a way to distribute code in, in a way that we haven't been able to do it as easily before. Micro front ends, it's made that life a lot easier. And that's where kind of the worst was because we didn't have the power of back end bandwidth where we could just do a lot of network chatter. But that back end network chatter still costs something. It costs infrastructure. And so Federation, I see it plays in very nicely where, you know, you could have a hundred services and you could have only one AWS Lambda ever deployed. And whenever you hit that Lambda, depending on what you're requesting the Lambda to do, it can federate a different service and respond as whatever you want. So mm -hmm. I'm, try I'm trying to bleed in where we get the, we take what backend did really well, we pull that into front end, and we take what front end can do really well, and we also bring that back to back end. And so I see it as just a good way to, you know, it's more micro front ends is yes, the big keyword. The bigger one I would say is distributed applications distributed oh, okay. and yeah. self and self forming run times where I, I, I could just throw stuff at the wall and a, an intelligent system will figure out what to do and scaffold it without me having to augment the architecture for it. I could just say, here's stuff. I need you to do it. Here's a CPU on the internet and it will compute the result that I want without me having to root 53 and Kubernetes and memory and, network and everything else that comes with you know setting up a distributed system okay thanks thanks for like this was way more detailed than i imagined my uh, little fun game to be we had three buzzwords uh two from me which was super apps micro apps uh the mm, micro front ends and then you you came with the biggest one i think which is distributed systems um Thank you, guys. I, I, I think that wraps it up. There is not much more that we can probably say about Module Federation, Webpack, all, all that. So thanks a lot, guys. Uh, it's been a pleasure to host you here today. Uh, I've learned a lot. I hope our listeners learned a lot as well. Uh, any last words? Thank you for hosting us. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so. thank you. Yeah. Um, it was it was really great to meet uh, to meet Callstack, you know, and uh, the Repack, you know, creator of Repack. There, um, it's definitely been a big answer to a lot of companies that I've worked with are extremely thankful for that. So it's really an honor to, to sit down and, and chat with you know the group involved in that tech. I think you've done a, a huge service for the the native application uh, market space. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, that was our episode about Module Federation of the React Native Show podcast. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. And uh, see you in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.